Some call it an interfaith dialogue. Others describe it as multicultural correctness. What we're increasingly seeing is that historic churches and entire denominations are broadening their theology to include prayers and recitations of Islam, Hinduism, and other faiths. So what's the fuss all about? Is it naive, dangerous, or just an attempt to become culturally relevant? And what does the Lord himself say in the Gospels about such controversies? Today, we'll examine some of these gates of deception. Hello, I'm Christine Darg, and welcome to the 21st century where historic doctrines and two millennia of worship are being tossed aside by some Christian churches in favor of being culturally inclusive, as if all religions worship the same God and expect to share the same heavenly eternity. I've already described all of this as the gates of deception. So let's take a few examples of what's going on with the blessing and approval of some church leaders who consider the gospel of the Lord Jesus is perfectly compatible with Islamic prayers and recitations, which have been highlighted in several of Britain's historic ancient cathedrals. We're indeed called upon to love Muslims, as we're commanded in the Gospels to love all people. But since Muslims will not accept that Jesus is God's son and that Jesus, in fact, died on the cross, should their doctrines be proclaimed in our ancient churches? Didn't the word of God warn us that the time will come when people will not be able to endure sound doctrine? Instead, to suit their own desires, people will gather around them a great number of teachers to proclaim what their itching ears want to hear. And recently at Gloucester Cathedral, the traditional Muslim invocation was performed in front of a thousand people at the launch of a multicultural faith exhibition. A local imam was invited by church leaders to give the Arabic call to worship in the cathedral's 11th century chapter house. Now, do we realize the power of words and of invocations? The Bible has a lot to say about calling upon other gods. Many who attended that event welcomed the act as an inclusive gesture of multiculturalism. But others question why a different God should be invoked in a sanctified Christian area of worship. One of the parishioners made a comment on social media saying that we're never to worship other gods in a house built for our Savior. She was apparently from the Gloucester area because she was also insulted that her ancestors had a part in building Gloucester Cathedral and now she felt it was being desecrated. She protested that allowing a practicing Muslim to pray to another God was, as she said, insanely naive. She said this was a violation of the first commandment to have no other gods before the Lord. She also wrote that we must stand firm Christians Bring people to the faith by telling them the truth, not by accommodating their heresies in our churches. Well, the row spread throughout the Twitter sphere with tweets saying that blasphemy had occurred at Gloucester Cathedral. The leaders of the cathedral defended the event, explaining that it was designed to promote religious tolerance and understanding. The leader stressed the fact that the Islamic call didn't happen inside the cathedral, but at an art exhibition held in the cathedral cloisters and chapter house, and that it was outside of the context of Christian worship. They said they were proud to hold the exhibition, and they would encourage everyone to learn more about people of different faiths. But many of the believers weren't buying the notion that the Islamic call to worship happened outside of sacred space because the event was still held within the cathedral compound. Well, in another recent event, the Reverend Dr. Gavin Asadin 
stepped down from his role as a chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen because of Islam's invasion in St. Mary's Cathedral in Glasgow. Dr. Ashenden's resignation followed the recitation of a section from the Islamic holy book, the Quran, that teaches Jesus is not the Son of God. And the passage was recited during a service to mark Epiphany, which is about the baby Jesus and him being born in a virgin birth as the Son of God. Dr. Ashenden said the reading at the cathedral in Glasgow could be viewed as blasphemy and is indicative of the rise of Islam in Britain while churchmen sleep. Speaking in a national press interview, Dr. Ashenden said that his first thoughts were astonishment that any Christian church, let alone a cathedral, would consider introducing a reading from the Quran instead of the Bible. And he was astonished that the reading chosen was one that contradicted the Bible's record of who the Messiah really is, God's only begotten son. Well, the Queen's former chaplain was quoted by Christianity Today, warning that the Church of England is dying because it's capitulating to liberal culture. Unless there's a real revival and reformation, Gavin Ashenden warned that the Church of England will collapse within decades because of its refusal to stand up for historic Orthodox Christianity. Presently, he sees no sign that the Church of England is going to reconsider its policy of accommodation with secular culture. Gavin Ashenden used to present the BBC's weekly Faith and Ethics radio program, and he was a member of the General Synod for 20 years. Sadly, he says the Church of England has abandoned certain key and apostolic norms. However, the faith is not dying out in other parts of the world, thankfully. He also contrasted the Church of England's decline with the rapidly growing churches in Russia and China. And he believes the difference is that they had not made an accommodation with the culture. Dr. Ashenden was following his conscience. He wasn't forced out of his position. He decided to resign after nine years as one of the Queen's chaplains. He said this was because the Queen should be above politics and as one of her chaplains, he didn't want to embroil her in the controversy, so he resigned. But he rebuked the Archbishop of Canterbury for remaining silent over the recitation of the Islamic text, denying Jesus as the Son of God, and for not speaking out on behalf of the integrity of Christianity. The brave priest said he wants to remain a faithful Anglican, but increasingly, he said, it looks like that is only possible outside of the Church of England. Well, I've become friends on Facebook with this brave clergyman and defender of the faith. In one of his Facebook entries, he posted Psalm 34. And he invited us, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Look upon him and be radiant, and your faces shall not be ashamed. This poor soul cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. And then the psalm goes on to say that the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is gracious, and blessed is the one who trusts in him. And the psalm encourages us to fear the Lord, all you holy ones, for those who fear him lack no good thing. Well, a number of evangelical believers have expressed the opinion that apostate clergymen at these cathedrals should apologize, and particularly they should apologize to the persecuted and suffering Christians in the Middle East who are being killed and whose houses and churches and property have been destroyed by ISIS and other Islamic radicals. Should comfortable clergy in the West undermine the faith of Christians who are holding down the fort so bravely in the Middle East? Thankfully, Israel is the one country in the Middle East where such intolerant and hateful actions are not allowed. And if occasionally something like arson happens against a church in Israel, the authorities are very quick to investigate and prosecute any perpetrator. Dr. Ashenden, who was one of the 36 chaplains to the Queen, 
pointed out that the Quran reading in Glasgow Cathedral also has implications for the queen's role as head of the church. He said the incident raised questions over how the queen and her representatives are expected to fulfill the role as defender of the faith, which of course is one of the queen's official titles. He warned that multiculturalism places increasing pressures on the Christian identity of Western countries and presents serious challenges to social stability. The role of a monarch who stands for the defense of the Christian faith just can't work in a multicultural and multi-faith context where other faiths increasingly have an agenda to diminish Christianity and replace it. In fact, the Syrian Orthodox Bishop for Austria and Switzerland, Dionysus Isa Gorbos, has warned that he expects Islam to take over Europe within 30 years. That is, unless the God of Israel himself intervenes to stop the takeover. There is a serious effort by secularists to move Christianity out of the public sphere, although ironically, it's thanks to the Christianization of Europe that we enjoy democratic, educational, and cultural privileges. Allowing other religions to be proclaimed in our cathedrals is a man-pleasing spirit that opens wide the gates of deception. You see, seeking the approval of other religious and cultures brings confusion and turns people away from the truth. If we choose to please men, we'll never gain the approval of the Almighty. In fact, the book of wisdom, Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 25 declares that the fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. In the New Testament, Paul asked the rhetorical question, am I trying to win the approval of men or of God? Paul said, if I were trying to please men, I would not and could not be a servant of the Messiah. Do you think these heresies have taken God by surprise? No way, because the Bible forewarned us of this type of heresy that would happen within the churches. A lying spirit will open the floodgate of deception, but God will also deliver us from heresy if we ask for his help and daily seek his wisdom. For example, the Apostle Peter warned in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, and believe me, this sounds so current. He said, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And listen to this. He said, they will secretly bring in false doctrines. I studied the Bible lexicon on this verse, and the verse literally means with stealth, they will infiltrate and introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them and bringing swift destruction on themselves. So what is the solution? Repentance, prayer, intercession. After all, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, that verse that means so much to us as we want to see our nations healed. It's a promise from God that says, if my people, that's not just the Jewish people, it's also the people of the book, the people of the Bible, God's people within the churches. God promises that if we will humble ourselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways and seek God's face, then he will hear from heaven He'll forgive our sin and heal our land. And Dr. Ashenden said he believes that Christian nations desperately and urgently need better education as to what Christianity and Islam actually promote. The kind of education that's needed would challenge the shallow relativistic dogma of contemporary educational theory, he said. Well, it's controversies like these recent two incidences in our cathedrals and cultural relativism that force us to pray daily, increasingly for wisdom. And James 1.5, one of my favorite verses that I lean on so much, declares that if you need wisdom, 
Ask our generous God and he will give it to you. And he will not rebuke you for asking. He will give wisdom liberally. Hallelujah. Jesus himself solemnly warned us in the Gospels to stay grounded, to be watchful and not to be deceived. If the Lord warned us to be on guard, lest any man deceive us, what does that mean? It means that there's a very likely chance of becoming deceived if we're not diligent and intelligent. When deception comes in many shapes and forms, we especially need to be careful not to be deceived. For example, just a few years ago, someone made up the name Chrislam in order to try to fuse together Christianity and Islam. Chrislam sounds politically correct, and it certainly is accommodating to the spirit of the world. Some naive churchgoers are accepting Chrislam as truth, but beware, you cannot mix truth with half-truths and falsehoods. In like manner, for decades, naive people have also been trying to sanction a form of Christian yoga in order to have yoga exercise classes in church basements and halls. But the word yoga itself means to be yoked with Hindu gods. And by the way, there are many testimonies available to search out of people who were delivered from the deception of Christian yoga. We also have to be careful not to celebrate Halloween. It seems harmless fun, but it's a capitulation to a form of satanic worship every year. You see, the Bible teaches very clearly that all forms of witchcraft are abominations to God, including fortune telling, astrology, prognostications, trying to communicate with the dead and so forth. Deception is increasing as the time of the second coming of Jesus grows nearer every day. We live in a time when we must hear the voice of Jesus for ourselves if we don't want to be deceived. We mustn't allow anyone to lure us away from following the good shepherd, Jesus. We must not go after other people and other gods. Jesus guides and leads his own every step of the way. The Bible teaches us that even Satan will appear cunningly, not as a devil with a pitchfork, but as an alluring angel of light in order to deceive many. So we mustn't fall prey to deception in any shape or form. We must be watchful and prayerful. Follow Jesus alone, not the masses and the latest unbiblical trends going on in the historic churches. You see, the one world church system is arising. Are we awake or did Satan lull us to sleep? Don't fall away from Jesus. We must open our eyes and ears and not be fooled. We must observe carefully what is going on and not accept as truth everything we read, see, or hear. With so much deception in the world, surrounding our eyes and ears in the media, we must discern and pray. So I want to return to my text, 2 Timothy 4.3. He said, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to and tolerate sound, wholesome doctrine. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. You see, the Bible warned us that people will turn away from the truth. They'll have a strong dislike of truth. They'll grow weary of the plain gospel of Jesus and They'll be greedy to gobble up fables and take pleasure in myths. Those who, like the Queen's former chaplain, Dr. Ashenden, pay the price and take a stand for truth are the ones who truly love souls in God's word. So let's not grow weary of taking every genuine opportunity to make known the true gospel that Jesus is Lord and he's coming soon to rule and reign from Jerusalem. By the way, I looked up the phrase, they will not endure sound doctrine in the Bible commentaries, and the Greek means literally, they won't be able to abide healthy doctrine. People will reject healthy doctrine. They'll no longer have a healthy appetite for good teaching that contributes to the health and well-being of their souls or to their salvation. But instead, at that time, they'll seek instruction more compatible with their lusts and feelings. 
and unbiblically correct doctrine and mantras will be in the mix. This verse says that people will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. The word rendered heap means to heap up, to accumulate, and here to multiply teachers who gratify. The grounds of their apostasy is hatred of the truth. Indeed, I was truly alarmed to watch segments of a recent women's march around the world, and there was an aggression in their demeanor that I've never seen before. Strong, blasphemous, vulgar language, rants against Bible principles. They heaped to themselves celebrities and teachers who, as it were, shook their fists in the very face of God. Women who delighted in describing themselves as nasty. And alarmingly, one feminist even shouted the Islamic call to prayer in defiance of Christian principles and anti-Semitism in the mix. It seems that many gates of deception have been opened in these last days. And it can become wearying constantly to have to combat lies. Yet we have always to keep in mind the good news that Jesus himself promised that even the very gates of hell will not be able to prevail against his church. It's our job to avoid the pitfalls in the gates of hell. And one of the biggest pitfalls is the love of this world. In the epistles of Paul, we read that one of his co-workers named Demas deserted the work of Paul. And why? Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4 and 9 that Demas deserted me because of the love of the world. The attractions of this world dazzle us and are a constant battle. We have daily to purpose to develop integrity into our lives. You see, the person who lacks basic, decent integrity is always vulnerable to deception. A person who lacks integrity can't walk in the truth of Jesus. As Paul warned, people who lack integrity will be treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Even something as seemingly harmless as an ungrateful attitude can open the gates of deception into a person's soul and body. Ingratitude and complaining can make us sick. Somebody sent me a communication full of gossip, hatred, and ill will. Yet the slanderer also said that they were suffering from sickness and disease. Go figure. The two go together. Well, Paul gave the best advice in Philippians chapter 2 in verses 14 to 15. And it sounds more relevant than ever. He told us, conduct yourselves without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine by contrast like stars in the universe. So before you so readily indulge in gossip, and yes, gossip is pure indulgence. Let me warn you that it's a slanderous spirit that opens the gates of deception and sickness. The spirit of gossip and slander tragically is heard too often among professing believers. An undisciplined tongue is a deadly enemy of the Lord and of ourselves. I must say, having lived for a long time amongst the Jewish people, religious Jews are much more careful than Christians when it comes to having a God-fearing attitude towards the dangers of the evil tongue. And Paul warned in 2 Corinthians 12, 20, when I come to you, I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, factions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder among you. Well, another danger that leads to deception, if we're not watchful, is fear itself, a spirit of timidity. Do you realize it was nothing but fear that prevented the Israelites from entering the promised land? Fear and unbelief. They wandered for a generation in the wilderness because of unbelief and fear. We think of murder and adultery as being big sins, but fear and unbelief are the first two sins listed in the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 8, when describing 
the sinners who will be consigned to the lake of fire. That verse is amazing. It reads, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the vile murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice the occult, idolaters, and all liars, their destiny will be in the lake of fire. So I want you to notice that cowards, the fearful, and the unbelieving top the list. Well, that list in Revelation 21 is pretty daunting. Even liars will be thrown into the lake of fire. And if truth be told, we've all told lies from time to time, and we can't deny it. We may not be adulterers and murderers, but anybody cannot claim purity of speech. Yet the Bible promises that if we will confess our sin, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the cleansing agent is the blood of Jesus, which was shed on the altar of the cross to cover and wipe out the sins of anybody, regardless of race or creed, who will put their faith and trust in the Savior. If you're not sure of your salvation, it's time to get sure. In fact, let's get sure right now, because the Bible is very clear on the matter of salvation. Romans 10, 9 teaches that if you will declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For all, the Bible says, who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that word saved means saved from eternal perdition, from that lake of fire. But it also encompasses physical healing, protection, wholeness, and deliverance. So how shall we escape if we neglect such a great, all-encompassing salvation? So I encourage you, take whatever you need from the Lord's great salvation without price and without delay in the name of Jesus. With his help in these last days, we're believing the Lord of the harvest to win at least a million souls in the time remaining before the second coming of Jesus. And so we covet your prayers for that. After all, Daniel 11.32 promises that those who know God will be strong, not weak, will be strong and do exploits. And if you're a watchman on the walls of Jerusalem, we'd like to stay in touch through social media. And we also invite you to visit our website at exploits.tv, where you can click online to receive our weekly update of new videos and Bible teachings. You can also request a copy of our free color magazine, Exploits. And at our website, we publish important prayer points regularly for watchmen, as well as notices about our upcoming prayer journeys in the Holy Land. And so until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm Christine Darg. Shalom.